Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, today, I have a very, very special guest, a uh, dear old friend and a man who's held in high esteem by many, many people, not least of all Robert Mustard Sensei. Um, I have today with me Mick Mercer Sensei. Uh, he, uh, his, his past is as interesting as his presence. So, Look, um, without further ado, Mercer Sensei, welcome to the show. Mercer oh, Sensei, it's a truly a great pleasure to be here. Anything spending time with you is on top of my list of things to do. Thank you. Okay, I also forgot to mention our sponsor, IKTV.online. Please check us out. Yep, it's pointing up there. And also, uh, Mercer Sensei is pointing to Aikido Shugyo and Aikido Jinsei. That's available on shinokanbooks.com. Chris will love you for that one. Okay, um, look, Mick Mercer Sensei started off life um, in the RAF after school. Is that right? Not quite after school. I, I spent a little bit of time wandering around, probably best described as a bum, to be honest, um, before. I, I joined when I was 21 and I left school at 17. So You didn't go to university? Did you go to university? No. Okay. So all you people who are worried about university education, don't. Take a leaf out of this man's note. A uh, book out of this, a page out of this man's book. Okay. Sorry, guys. Now, it, it's very rare that you get someone who starts at the absolute bottom of the military ladder and then climb as high as Mick Mercer Sensei did. He retired a wing commander. And for all our cousins in the United States, what's that e the equivalent to? Wing commander. <laughs> uh, what's the equivalent in the States? Oh, in the States, lieutenant colonel. Okay, right. So he, he went all the way from a private to lieutenant colonel. How did you manage that? Um, I, I've frozen on my screen here, but everybody else can see me, can they? That's yep. working. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, well, I, I kind of joined because I, I had, as I said, I was a bum and I, I had no direction and I found something happened in my life where I needed to find some uh, direction and ability to look after myself and others. So I joined the Air Force. Um, I got in, as, as you say, the lo lowest level and did a, a course on electronic engineering really um and i did well at it I, I applied myself as best i could i did well it was the mid to late 70s uh height of the cold war we had an air force that was enormous and towards the end of the course i remember it well actually i was summoned into the squadron leader's office and i was desperately trying to think what i'd done wrong and why i was going to be in trouble and he basically said we're looking for people with your kind of concentration. Uh, he actually said, we're looking for people who, but for their education, would be riding a motorbike fast down the A1 um, uh, to be pilots because they were, were desperately short. And he said, how would you like to have a go? So I had a go and started officer training in 79. Mm. And went through flying training. Okay, um, I, I'm going to skip a lot of stuff, but you you saw active duty. Um, can you tell us where without going into details? Um, well, yes. Uh, from, from the early 80s, to be honest, the Cold War, though nobody ever fired a missile, that was pretty much active duty. My first tour was in Germany, and we were on five-minute readiness pretty much all the time. I mean, not everybody. But we always had somebody on literally five minute readiness. Um, and, it, and it was pretty tense, pretty, pretty tense days. Then the first Gulf War, I, I was out for flying in the very first Gulf War. Um, first British aviators to go out there right at the very beginning. Um, I was in the Falklands in 84 after the war, but still quite tense. Um, flying off a makeshift runway. Um, waiting in case they came back again. It was tense, but again, not a missile fire. Bosnia, Herzegovina, that 
particular conflict there again. Um, never fired a missile, but, you know, saw some active service there and did some quite exciting stuff. Hmm. Um, now here comes the ambush. Okay. Why fish? Ah, well, nobody knows. I'm, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> okay. Was that was that your call sign or just a nickname? Um, they're, they're the same thing. Okay. It, it was, you know, people, it, it would be a call sign, you know, just like you see in Top Gun, you know, Maverick and all that stuff. But we're in the, we're British. We have things like fresh and jelly rather than, you know, Maverick and killer. Okay. So people, for the record, I tried, but really no one knows why he's called fish and we'll leave it at that Mick the fish it was sorry Mick the fish Mick the fish that's gonna be famous now that's gonna stick <laughs> or stink um you mentioned top gun uh, as in the movie but you also did a course similar to that or did you do it or did you run it no no i i it, it's kind of a qualification. It's called, uh, the, you know, the, the Americans call it Top Gun. Sounds really exciting. We call it the QY course, Qualified Weapons Instructor. Um, and it's a four-month intense course learning um, really just every, everything about. You are in charge as, as a QWI, um, all the weapons, tactics, strategies, um, standards of not but combat flying and also teaching so you you know i would sit in the back seat with another pilot in the front and teach him how to do air to air gunnery air to ground gunnery um all that kind of stuff and did you like that yeah it's good fun for sure okay um... and, and you know when when things like the first gulf war came along um, it was a very different um, requirement to what we were used to. So it was the QWIs who would be looking at developing new tactics, new strategies, new ways to employ the, the systems we had. So it was quite technical as well as, um, you know, flying. It was also, you know, mechanically and, and, and systems technical too. So tell, tell me, what were you doing in Malaysia? Uh, I was part of the five partner defense agreement, which is between Malaysia, Singapore, New Zealand, Australia and Britain, which I think came about as an agreement when I'm not quite sure Britain left or Malaysia left um, their ties with Britain, but to uh, assure they had um defense of peninsula malaysia specifically that i was the director of operations what did that entail uh running the strategies and, and exercises to look after the defense air defense of peninsula malaysia and that took in five different countries five different nations yeah and, and i was the senior brit there so Okay, so we're going to come back to that later. Sure. Um, uh, get, before we go on to your life as a martial artist and stuff, can you tell us about flying your plane into a tree in Scotland? Oh, that's a good one. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've done my homework. Uh, I'm not sure what you want to know about it, but basically um, I was coming back of a night mission and got into some serious fog on the approach low fog and ended up flying through a tree in fog on a hill and did you destroy the aircraft or uh it was what we call category three which means it needed quite a lot of work they needed to put new wings on it because we cut through quite a lot of metal on the wings and I didn't know at the time. I ended up landing at another airfield, Prestwick, which is Glasgow Airport, effectively. And um, when I did the walk around of the aeroplane before I left it, 
I found big holes in the wing and branches in the undercarriage. So it was a bit exciting. Okay. Ooh. Everyone knows how prestigious the Red Arrows are. Why'd you turn mm -hmm. it down? I didn't really turn it down. I wasn't, you, I mean, I was offered a chance to go and apply, um, but I, I didn't, I mean, I didn't want to. It, it, it might be prestigious to the outside, but, I, you know, it, it would be like if you are a martial artist in the days when it was about doing the job, would you rather be on the battlefield or going around demonstrating to people how to do your art? Well, well, well put, well put. Um, okay, since retirement, you've set up a dojo, a full-time dojo. Yes. And uh, I also have to quote someone. Um, he's one of those annoying people who ends up being good at anything he puts his mind to. And since his mm -hmm. retirement, those things have become more frequent. How do you, you know, look, I've been to your place. I've seen your woodwork. I've seen you, the canoes you've built. I've seen your pizza oven, your cooking skills. Um, how does one get so talented in so many things? Um, I, I, I wouldn't say so talented in so many things. Have I would. At, I would. I have a go at a lot of things. Um, um, I think try to reach a competent level. Uh, I wouldn't say talented, um, but I think you know if, if you if you try to do something and, and apply yourself, anybody can reach a level of competence. And and I would say that's a, that's about it, really. Um, I I don't think uh, I, I'm at a high level at anything. I probably was at flying and fighting in the Air Force, but that was my professional job and I managed to, to spend a long time studying and training to, to get to a high level. But everything else, I think, a level of competence is how I would put it. Honestly, you know, that's not trying to be self-effacing and humble. That's genuinely what I think. It's easy for you to say. I'm the kind of person who measures something four times and still cuts it the wrong size. Yeah. Yeah. So well, I can you know, teach you how not to do that if you like. <laughs> I'll, I'll next time I come and see you, I'll take uh, lessons. Um. You. What made you start up your a full time dojo? That's that's a really interesting question, and um, I I kind of I I mean I retired early from the air force and I genuinely don't want to go into why, but I did become a little bit kind of disillusioned with what was going on and what, what my future career path would be. Um, and you get a reasonable pension from when you retire, not if you retire early, um, but from the age of 55, I've had a, a reasonable pension that I could live on. Um, and I didn't really want to go into a second career doing something similar to that which I had spent my time in the Air Force doing. A lot of people uh, of my sort of my peers would go fly the airlines. Um, I didn't want to do that. Um, they would go into defense industry, which if you have the QWI tick, it is quite easy to get into the defense industry because uh, they're the people who, who are like top of the list for that kind of thing. I didn't want to do that. Um, I, I loved Aikido. I, I genuinely did. I've been studying Aikido since 1990, I think. So I came to it quite late. Um, and I thought Ken Robson was running a, a successful dojo and, and making a a success of it, I thought I'd have a go when I retired in Preston because it would be doing something totally different and something I truly loved. Hmm. Okay, what we talk about Ken Robson, um, you started, who did you start under and can you like briefly talk about some of your past teachers? Right, I first started martial arts 
in 1977, studying judo when I went on my first um, RAF course. And, and I loved it. It was brilliant. The, the school was, I think, very much like Aikido is now. It, it wasn't really competition based. It was art based. And, and the training was, you know, fabulous stuff you couldn't do now. And probably rightly so, you know, you, you'd do bunny hops around the mat for the first 15 minutes of the class and, and all those kind of old fashioned kind of things that you used to do. Um, and when I ended up getting a commission and starting flying training, that was pretty intense and there was no time for, for doing anything else. So that kind of stopped. Um, and it stopped for a little while. My first tour was again, you know, on your first tour, you're entirely um, focused on trying to sort of build your knowledge. Um, and then I had children. I wanted them to do something useful. So I enrolled them in, in martial arts. Uh, I found a karate school for them. And then we moved um, to where I was based, where Ken was based. I put my kids into his class and liked what I saw. And one New Year's Eve party, I was having a beer and at midnight smoking a fag and said, I'm going to join. And I joined on the 6th of January or something when we when he opened up. Cool. Um, just very quickly, your, your impressions of uh, Ted Stratton. Um, I met Ted Stratton and trained under him not he was never my teacher but I, I went to many seminars I liked him he was a generous man um, I thought he was you know competent he was good uh, he gave freely with his knowledge and, and was kind and generous and I thought it was fabulous cool. and I'm really proud to have known him and and you spent a few years training with Francis Sami. Can you give us your um... yeah, it, a similar man? I mean, Francis Sami. It, it was wonderful to me. I'd been training probably for 13, 14 years by the time I met Ramasami Sensei, and he he was magical. You know, it was a different level, to be honest, to what what I'd seen before. I mean, he was. Hugely competent. He was getting a bit old and losing his sight. Um, and after several months of training with him, he actually got me to teach a lot of the classes. Mm. Um, but he used to teach on a Sunday morning specifically, and I'd always make sure I went to that that class. And um, you know, he, he was. I guess I think yeah. I, I met him before I met you. I think. Um, properly because I came over to your dojo I think in about 2002 2002 or three something like that when I first met you and I was training with Francis Ramasamy then I, I met you in Malaysia before that yes you did that's true in yes. 2002 as well um, yeah so, okay moving along um, you you run a dojo and you ran military units, or I don't know what the word is for them. Um, are there similarities, differences between how, the, between the training, the running of a dojo, the management of a dojo, the management of a unit, the training of military, as opposed to training in uh, the dojo? I, that's a, a really tough and, and deep question. And yes, there's huge differences. Um, Martial arts are arts pertaining to war, uh, you know, that's what they are. And when you're in the military, your job is pertaining to war. You're preparing to go to war. Um, there is a strict structure. And this is really vital. You are paid to do your work, your training and, and your job. I don't know of any, I don't know of any, I'm sure there are, martial arts schools who pay their students <laughs> to, to be students. And that's, I think, a real important difference. 
because when your training is also your livelihood, you kind of have to do it the way it is told. In terms of managing, I mean, managing is very different to leading. Um, managing is, is pretty much the same. You know, you just got to have good governance. You want to expand on that a bit? No, but can you talk about the difference between uh, leadership and management? And the relevance uh, in, in a dojo or in, in a military situation unit? Uh, management is governance. It's looking after all the administrative details, looking after people's careers, looking after your, what your people need, looking after all of the finances. Leadership is inspiring people to be able to go into battle and be willing to die, I guess, in, in that sense. Hmm. And all that goes with that. Right. Guys, uh, if you don't listen to any part of the interview, remember that part, that sentence he, uh, Mick Mercer since they just said. Uh, uh, talking about, you, you've got female instructors in your dojo, yes? Yes. Um, you, you actually pay people to teach in your dojo, yes? I, I missed that, that broke up. Uh, you actually pay people to teach in your dojo, to run the I dojo. I have one, one teacher I pay, yes. Okay, so then going back to what you said about people being paid for their jobs, paid for their training like in the military. Yes. Uh, this is a stupid question, an obvious question, but I'm going to ask it. How much higher is your expectations from someone you're paying than someone you're not paying? Or someone um, who's paying you? Oh, I, it's chalk and cheese, totally different. Uh, the person that I pay has to represent me, uh, my dojo, and all those that I consider in the lineage above me. They are representatives of all of that and my dojo and the school uh, that we are part of, which is Shobukai, Robert Mustard, Yoshinken, Aikido. They, they have to be representatives of that. And if they're not, then, you know, they wouldn't have a job. So but then how do you get people who are students to excel to that level if you don't put them under the same scrutiny and the same intensity? I, um, I, I know where you're going. For me, I, I think you do, but it has to be from them. They have to subject them or be wanting to subject themselves to that kind of level. And if you see that kind of commitment, from a student and you see that that is a student that has that potential then you you can perhaps start to intensify what you do with them i and i'm sure you don't or maybe you do i don't treat all of my students the same cool. all right now um women in the military women in in martial arts mm. uh, they both male dominated arenas um yeah. what are your thoughts or what are your experiences I, it's a very broad question i just want to know your impression it is a very broad um question um in in aikido i can honestly say um i i don't think there is any difference in the way that we train in in our dojo a woman and a man 100 percent, no difference whatsoever uh, treated the same, thrown the same, uh, I, I, nothing, no difference to me whatsoever. Characters are different, but, you know, I, I don't see any problem there at all. I, and I think some of the best practitioners I've seen, not at the highest level, because I haven't seen many very high level females, um, but uh, I think some of the best practitioners I've seen are, are females and i know you have several too all of whom i highly respect um in the military you have to remember my experience i've been out of the military now for a long time and i had one of the very first female air crew on my squadron um and things were different back 
back in my day. Um, I, I'll tell you a funny story, actually, that um, I did the Joint Service Defence College, which is a, a, a high level um, course for preparing people to go into the, the higher ranks. And um, one of the debates we had, that was in 96, I think it was. Um, so women weren't really in frontline jobs. And one of the debates we had on that course was, you know, the suitability of females in the front line. Um, to cut it pretty short, the, you know, but debates talked about um, biology, they talked about capability. But one of the, the big arguments came from an army guy was, listen, when you're in the trenches fighting, and you just have to drop your pants and have a pee, you can't have women and men in the same trenches. That was one of their arguments. Um, and I thought, yeah, that's a fairly sensible point. You're not very comfortable with that. A couple of years later, I was commanding a, a squadron, and I decided I would run the Great North Run half marathon. So not a particularly high-level combat situation. And just before you go for the run, Everybody runs into the bushes to have a pee because you're going to be running for a little time. You don't want to stop for a pee. And I was having a wee and literally two feet next to me, a woman popped along, dropped her keks, squatted down, had a chat and said, what do you think? How, how fast are you going to run the half marathon? And I thought they couldn't do this in the trenches, but they're quite happy to do it in the, in the half marathon. And that kind of made me realise maybe some of my previous prejudices weren't so well founded. Hmm. Yep. Hey, uh, the old saying, if you don't change your mind, you never change anything. Yeah. I, um, I think, it, you know, it's really important and I might be wrong. It might, I think Muhammad Ali, I think it might, was him said something like me. If you show me a man when he's 40, who has the same opinions and, and views that he had as 20, I'll show you somebody who's wasted their life. Because you know, change and develop. Yeah, I, I think um, I think yeah, I think it was him. Uh, I want to ask you. Told me once we were talking like it, it's a big thing now. Like you said before we came on air, uh, um, this thing about uh, does Aikido work? The 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 practicality of Aikido, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You once said to me that you cannot prepare anyone for an actual altercation or actual combat the you know um you, do, do you stand by that yeah i really do um because combat where you're going to kill or die that's pretty intense stuff and you know most people don't really ever face that mm. um and I think there's a very big difference. You could say, I mean, if you look at MMA, but some of the guys that fight there, that, that's, I would be absolutely petrified to go and do that stuff. You're putting your body on the line, but you don't expect to kill somebody or die. It might happen, but it might happen when you go and drive off after this interview. You might have a crash and die, but it's not forefront in your mind that, this alteration, alter, for this thing is about that ultimate um, act of killing somebody or of ultimate sacrifice. And that takes some getting your head around when you actually are in a position to go and do that. And, and if you talk about the street, you know, which I think for me um, is, a, is a strange term, the, you know, there's so many other factors in play. You, you couldn't kill somebody. Think of the hassle you'd have after that, even if it was in self-defense and, you know, within the limits of reasonable force at the case. So combat is very different and, and it's a different mindset. I so, think. Okay, not, not just combat, but just altercations as well. I think we were talking about altercations and you said there's okay, well, no way to physically again, prepare yourself. So. I, I think, um, yeah, I, uh, 
if 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 um if you're a lurker on the fellowship page like me um i think paul stevens wrote um, a little bit about himself but at the end of it he wrote something that i thought was absolutely bob on in an altercation um the the aggressor will instigate in you either fear or competing aggression and if that happens they really have control but he said if you show neither you're just totally neutral then they'll back off and and i think um there's a lot of well there's a lot of truth in that he said it and he's as a policeman who's would have far more experience on a man-on-man -man altercation than I ever did. And Phil Musson sensei, who uh, is also a policeman, I talked to him many times and he has lots of experiences where he's been face to face with somebody, you know, wanting to do him harm. And he would say exactly the same thing. Mm. Ask yourself, not you, but listeners, if somebody was stood in front of you with a machete with the intention of cutting you, would you be able to show neither fear or competing aggression? I doubt if you would, because you can only get, I think, to that level in that situation through experience. And through experiencing it, you will develop that ability to do it. And, and that's through exposure you, you become a little more desensitized to it okay so then as a taxpayer i have to ask why is there so much money being poured into military training police training law enforcement if, if you can't prepare someone for that final bit well, I, 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 the devil's advocate i don't necessarily agree 100 percent with you but i want to hear your opinion well well you can prepare them and you can do some seriously intensive training to prepare them. But being prepared for it is not the same as doing it. It's kind of like, I think you just go to a different level and you gain experience from the combat, the, the actual altercation. But you can't simulate that reality. I agree. No, I agree. I agree. So would you say then then all martial arts training is pointless? No, I wouldn't. I think that's all part of preparing for it. For example, you know, the, the, the mental aspect, and that's all mental. Um, <laughs> it's all up here. But you can prepare your body to be capable of dealing with something. And if your body is capable of dealing with it, then you are going to be more mentally able to face it more confident to face it so i think you know through through building your physical and to a degree mental ability you become better prepared but it's not the same as the actual altercation okay all right so the better prepared you are the closer you will be to being able to show that that neutral stance there's but, sorry go on no no but but the more you actually have the real experience the even better you will become yeah look i, I would like to add some things to that but i i want Please your opinion. no no I, I want your opinion so um i need i need to, and i need to move on uh you know without causing any offense you're no spring chicken no and like you said you started late mm -hmm. you carry and i know this first then you carry some nasty injuries but but you've persevered and persevered and i've seen your aikido change from when i first met you in 2002 um just you know um, amazingly change and i guess um, robert mustard sensei has a big part to play in that but your perseverance and your dedication um like I said, you you know you didn't start in an early age. Can you talk about that? Yeah, of course I, I can. Um, and I think that's very kind of you to say that. And 
if it's true, it's because I, I, I genuinely love the art of Aikido. I find it fascinating on so many levels. I mean, physically, mentally, and for want of a better word, because it's used spiritually. And, and, I, and I think to get to a, a reasonable level, you've got to kind of be pushed and, and experience, certainly on a physical level. And what I mean by mental level is, you know, when your body is really tired and you keep pushing and then you feel it can't go anymore, you use your mental strength to push you on. I think you've got to do some of that to, to progress. Um, and I enjoy that, you know, it's challenging and, and interesting, though, if I'm really honest and frank, I just struggle with that now because my body hurts so much um, and it doesn't recover like it used to recover you know I if, if I did a hard session it, it would be weeks I would suffer I genuinely you know but I think that happens as you get older and I think you just got to get wiser um, to it in, in terms of you know Aikido developing it I, I would like to say a couple of things for the record I started with Ken Robson who is a fabulous martial artist, top notch. And, you know, if you want to know the sort of qualities that epitomize a martial artist, you've got them all there in, in one man. And I'm sure you would agree with that. He, he is a genuine martial artist. And, and I have him to thank for um, instilling that feeling in me. Um, I He is my teacher. He was my first teacher. But because of the, the way the Royal Air Force is, I moved away from him through and I tried to train wherever I could and, and there was a period in my Aikido life where there was times you know where I didn't have a teacher I tried Aikikai people and, and I didn't get on with it that's not to say it's bad it just didn't suit me um, I spent a period when I trained with David Rubin sensei in London but I was in a, a job in defense intelligence at the time and I just never made it regularly, which was a bit sad. Um, I trained for two years with Francis Ramasamy Sensei, which was enlightening for me because it showed me a different, um, I won't say level, but a, a different aspect of Aikido that I uh, hadn't really discovered before. And at about that same time, um, Robson Sensei was making a relationship with yourself and um, I came over to Australia when he was there we spent a, a few times and that was another enlightening moment you know what we had done I would never say was time wasted but I think if you look back you could say it was time that could have been better spent and we would all agree with that Robson Sensei would agree with that so we started to look at how we could improve and we got you over many times and um, then we decided to you know try and look further to find other areas of inspiration and you introduced us to Robert Mustard Sensei and um, myself uh, Robson Sensei and Phil Mustard Sensei went over to Canada and spent two weeks training with Mustard Sensei and that completely changed my view of Aikido um, what he was doing just struck a chord with me. All the stuff you read about the magical things, it, it I suddenly made sense how people could write that kind of stuff, how you couldn't feel anything and suddenly you were on the floor. Never made sense to me until he threw me. And um, I, I kind of at that point decided, got to start again, really, um, and, and try and learn again. And... I remember having a discussion with you about, you know, how and, and where I took my own Aikido. And it could easily have been, and, and rightly and fairly so, because the same feelings were for you and your Aikido. You could have said, come, come and join my organization. But what you did is said, I think Mustard Sensei is a better fit for you. You, you put me and my needs above you and your organization and that really sits with me 
still and now. And if you want to know what true leadership is, it's putting the people that you have influence over and their needs above your own. And you did that. So you don't need any lessons on leadership. Since. Well, I just didn't like you and I didn't like Rob. So I said, put you two together. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I need to move on. I need to move on. Uh, th this thing with the Yoshinkan Aikido Fellowship Group. Um, mm -hmm. you, you've seen it and you know what John Marshall Sensei is trying to do. And as someone who's worked with military from five different countries trying to, oh, where's the camera, pull them together, what would be your advice in for John Marshall Sensei, like trying to put the toothpaste back in the tube, trying to not, not unite, but try to bring the different groups together? How do we do that? Okay, um, please. That's the second ambush. Yes, shoot me down. And uh, please, these are my opinions. It doesn't mean they're right. But uh, and, and honestly, I, after this, I will go away and think about it and change what I say now. I, I, because you will, you know, that you've asked me a question that needs a lot of deep thought. But I'll be honest and open and blunt. Um, first off, social media, for me, isn't the place to, to be doing things. It has its place and it's useful and I'm loving the Facebook page. There's lots of good stuff, but um, I don't think that's the place to do things because I could be a 19 year old. Nobody knows me. I have no experience and I can type all sorts of stuff and, and start to influence and And there's no comeback. There's no um, face to face stuff. And it, in my experience, it pretty much generally always degenerates into a sort of keyboard warrior thing. So I think it has its place and its value, but I don't think uh, social media is a, a place to bring everybody together. In terms of an organization that's huge and global, I, my view is it needs leadership from the top, but it also needs leadership delegated. Are you still there? You're frozen. No, no, I'm listening. I'm listening. Uh, de delegated down. So, I I mean, Spike Kameda Sensei said something like, if you want to be known at the Hombu and they don't know you, that's your fault. And he's dead right. But I don't think, you know, you have to, not everybody has to be known by the Hombu. What you need is a system where you are known down your line to the hombu so the, the hombu could should know the you know the senior eighth and seventh dans intimately and trust them ultimately for them they should know the fifth and sixth dans under them intimately and trust them ultimately and things should feed up through that system and I don't know. I mean, I, I just run my dojo and try to be good and loyal to my teacher, Robert Mustard Sensei. But I don't know if that happens. Hmm. Yeah, so, you know, look, my, my opinion is a lot like the military. You should be responsible for two levels down. That's kind of what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. Um, but but what's, not... what's, really, what's really important is all the top people they need to talk to each other. It's no good having one top person talking to the hombu and another one, and these two never talk to each other. The top people need to bring it all together and then disseminate that unity. I, I would I would disagree. I would say that uh, along, maybe not disagree, but the top people need to put out a vision. And it's up to the next level to, to drive that vision, bring it together, and get the top people to sign it off, sign off on it. Uh, because if you get people who are ex dance, they, we had our time, and we, we didn't do anything with it. He doesn't want to do it again because there was so much acrimony when the IYF started. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm paraphrasing what he said. Uh, you know. I don't have the time or, or the intent 
Robert Mustard def doesn't definitely doesn't. We want things to happen, but we're not willing to drive it. That's why I think the the next rank up, the people like the John Marshalls, the Michael Kimedas, these people are in the perfect position to to drive the vision of the the top people. We pretty much well, what you're think, saying, but yeah. Yeah, no, no, but that's how, that's the reality of how things work in real life it's not the top people who do all the thinking they, they you know you have people doing that so yeah you're saying the same thing as me same, same thing. We're, we're speaking in parallels but yeah. you know the other thing is just think about a room big enough to fit all the egos ain't gonna happen you need a convention well, center well you know that that's just about being mature you know get rid of that and, <laughs> and don't put yourself above the the organization i don't think you know the same people i know um well yeah look um there was one more thing i needed to ask you um but it slipped in my mind it's just something about what you said i wanted to pick you up on it um look we're, we're going to be winding up about now mick and is you know COVID's kind of easing off now so what I want to ask you, I've, I've asked in the past what people can do, what do you think people can do during lockdown and stuff like that? But now I want to ask you, how can people learn a lesson from being in lockdown, from being separated from the things you like? Is What lesson can we take away from that? Um. Thanks. That's another ambush, you know, brilliant. I I think discipline, it's so much more difficult to spend half an hour or so a day training in lockdown than it is when you've got a dojo to go to, somebody to motivate you, somebody to, to lead you in that. So, you know, self-discipline and a little bit of uh what's the word it's he not only does your body fail when you get old so so does your mind um i'll stick with self-discipline just that that ability to to stick with what what you said how many people at the beginning had these good intentions i'm going to use this time to do something because and, and have stopped doing whatever it was you know um Relook at that and put a little bit of stick to what you said you would do. So I think you can learn or reflect on how strong or weak your own perseverance is to actually finish and do something. And that's integral to martial arts training. It's absolutely integral to being in the military, you know, that you do not stop however tough it gets. Um, being bored is tough. Cool. I, I was going to ask you for some final words, but I think that about sums it up. I, I will. I, I will give you a final word because no, a lot of not yet, not yet, not yet. Okay. I remember the question I was going to ask you. Okay. All right. You are one of those generations of people who run a dojo that I respect, who have never been to train in Japan. Um, and yet you run a tight dojo, a good dojo, a, a dojo that I would be happy to visit anytime. Um, do, do you think there's a need to go to Japan? Do you think, do, do, you, do you have a need? Do you think your students should go there? How do you feel about Japan being the central part? I'm not, I'm not fishing. I'm asking a question. No, I, I think... Um... From my experience, I haven't been to Japan. I wish I had. I think culturally, martial culturally, if that's a word or phrase, I think it, it's important. And I think there's something missing um, for me that I haven't done it, haven't actually been where it is actually founded. And, and I think ideally you should, as part of your training, go to Japan. But I think... If you can find the right people that have been, that understand the culture and run their dojos in the right manner, 
I think you can go some way to um, mitigating not going, but I don't think anything actually is a substitute for the real thing. Um, but I, but I think you know you can find top class um, Aikido and teachers not in Japan, and Mustard Sensei and his dojo is one of them. You and your dojo are one of them. I've had the great pleasure of being at Darren Friend Sensei's dojo only once, but that to me was one of them. Ramlan Ortega Sensei's, Pavel Felicic Sensei's. There's lots of great dojos out there where you can get top class um, Aikido teaching. But culturally, I think, you know, if you want the full thing, you have to go to Japan. Well said. One day, one day I'll tell you Inoue Sensei's answer to that question. Now, your final words before we wrap it up. Um, I just, you know, th there were people, a lot of talk about Aikido and does it work on the fellowship stuff at the moment. And I think for me, you've got to realize we, we, when we study a martial art, we do it for lots of reasons. And one of them undoubtedly is to, to help us build the ability to be able to physically take care of ourselves in an altercation. That is an important part of it. Um, but there's lots of other reasons we do it because let's be honest, most of us aren't going to be in a physical altercation very often. I am 63 years old and I've probably been in two or three in my life. Um, I've avoided a lot and I've been in situations where it could have happened, but I've managed to avoid it. Um, I think if you want it to be something for physical self-defense, then you've got to train in a manner that makes it relevant. But also there's lots of other reasons to train in Aikido. If you can take a young person who took five telephone calls to even come into the dojo, had to sit down and watch a class with a teacher next to them to be able to actually build up the courage to even get on the mat. And several years down the line, that same person can hold the intention of a room of a hundred people without knowing any of them. I think their training has probably worked and been effective too, if you get my meaning. Yep, definitely, definitely. So there's lots of, lots of ways that Aikido works and it's not only in terms of self-defense on the street. But I also believe that if your training doesn't have the intent and the feeling that it would have if you were doing it in order to be able to go out onto the battlefield and face life or death, if you don't train with that feeling and intent, then it's meaningless. Well said, well said. Thank you very much. Um, look, the hour has gone really fast. Uh, Mick Mercer Sensei, thank you very much. Uh, everyone, hashtag keep the flame alive. And I don't know what the hashtag means. I've just been told to say it. Um, IKTV.online, if you want to support us, that's your best way. Uh, just go on. If you don't want to subscribe, don't. But go on and have a look. There's a free channel as well. Uh, I'm not a good salesman. Now, next week, we have, uh, I've always wanted to draw the analogy between art, as in what some would call real art, as in painting, et cetera, et cetera, music, and martial arts. I want to draw that analogy. And next week, we've got an artist who has been an artist for most of his life, uh, Elio Sanciolo Sensei. He runs a dojo. He's a fifth dan in Aikido, uh, a former teacher as well. So I'm going to talk to him about lots of things. But the main thing I want to talk to him about is, are we teaching an art form in a scientific manner? And if that's appropriate. So is Yoshinkan no Aikido uh, a science or an art? First question. Second, are we teaching an art form through in a scientific manner? Or are we teaching a science in an art, as an art? My question. Think about it, guys. Join us next week. Mick Mercer Sensei, again, thank you very much. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Always a pleasure, Sensei. Us. Thank you.